All right, so uh, welcome back to Acosta's Anatomy. And in this lecture, we're going to uh, talk about vision. And so uh, what I'm going to point out to you are uh, some of the different anatomical structures that are found on the eye model. So we'll go over some of the external features and then also um, some of the internal features and then um, discuss a little bit about like the microanatomy of the retina and a couple of other um, different, different topics. And so if you find my lectures helpful, uh, make sure to hit that uh, like button and also um, subscribe. So uh, let's get started. So I have two different eye models here and I'm gonna start off, start off with the, the small eye model here first. Um, because there's uh, different features between the two, the large and the smaller one. So the outer part here of the eye, this is what's known as the sclera. And this uh, is what serves as an attachment site uh, for the muscles. So some of the different muscles include superior, inferior rectus, and then this is the medial, and then this is the lateral rectus. So uh, the reason I know this is medial is because if you look at number five right here, this is the superior oblique tendon. So that's another one of the eye muscles. So then um, here on the bot bottom, this is the inferior oblique. Okay. So then uh, some of the other different external features. So you have this part, which is known as the cornea. Um, so you have the cornea here. And then on the, back side of the eye of, on the back side of the eye, let me take this sticker off real quick. So this is the optic nerve. You can see all of the different axons there for the optic nerve. And then um, this is the connective tissue, the sheath that's covering the um, opt optic nerve. And then these arteries and veins that are here, these are the central retinal arteries. So it gives its own um, blood supply to the retina because the retina, um, it needs its nutrients, right, in order for all of the cellular um, processes to occur. So uh, let me, like, I've mentioned, like, what the retina is. So let me, like, briefly show you on, th uh, that's what this model is. It's primarily showing the retina. So this here is the retina, and then this is the choroid where the blood supply of the eye is. And then this is the sclera, the white part of the eye. Okay, so that's some of the um, basic anatomy. I'm gonna like further um, get into that, but I want to um, rehash a topic that we have already discussed, uh, which was refraction. Um, so whenever at the beginning of the semester, we learned about uh, microscopes and that what refraction is. Okay, so what refraction is, is whenever light strikes a different type of medium, it bends. So this is a similar thing applied to, to optics, applied when we talk about vision. So refraction occurs at two sites, uh, two main sites within the eye. So first is it strikes the cornea, which is what um, I already showed, uh, showed you. But the next one, so I'm going to take this eye model apart a little bit. And then so this is the, so this part on the outside, this is the choroid and then this is the colored part of the eye, the iris, and then this is where the pupil would be. But if I take this off, this part where number 25 is, that's where the lens is. Okay, so light is gonna refract first at the cornea and then next at the lens. Okay, so let me uh, work my way to the board so we can talk about um, refraction. And so um, the reason that refraction um, is important and then uh, especially like with vision. So this is how they go about like understanding this concept concept is for um, corrective vision. So, you know, whenever you go to the eye doctor, like what type of lens it is um, that they prescribe to you. Okay. So what I have here drawn, so these are three different eyeballs. And so this is what's representing a normal eyeball. This is what's representing uh, someone that is farsighted. And then this eyeball is representing someone that is nearsighted. So just so you remember, right? So if you're nearsighted, that means you can see near, so you can see things close to you, but you can't see things that are far away. Okay. So if someone is farsighted, that means that they can see things that are far away, but they can't see things that are near, that are close to them. Okay. So there are a couple um, different issues as to why people become, why they're farsighted, why they're nearsighted, and so on. So this first one, it represents a 
a, a normal eye and so when the light rays are traveling here, so this is where the cornea is, the lens would be here. So light goes in, it bends, it refracts, and then it hits the back of the retina. So this is the back part of the eye. So that's what's represented on this eye model here. So when we hit some of these, they're called photoreceptors, that's what sends the signal through the optic nerve. It eventually leads to the optic nerve. And then the optic nerve comes out, and then it travels down this visual pathway until we get to the primary visual cortex. So we've identified that on the, eye, on the uh, brain model already earlier, um, earlier in the semester. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the visual pathway, but right, I'm still trying to finish uh, corrective vision here. So it's going here and the light is focused here, right? Because the light rays are converging at this point. So we get a clear image. And so the image that's formed, is it gonna be, um, so let me tell you this. So because both of these lenses are known as convex lenses or converging lenses, what is gonna be, so think of the letter E from the microscope. What is the image gonna be? Is it gonna be upright or is it gonna be inverted? Yeah, it's gonna be, it's gonna be inverted. So that's the image that forms on the back of the retina, okay? So that's normally a focused image. So then let's talk about if someone is farsighted. So someone if is farsighted, another term is hyperopic. That's another term they used to describe that. So hyper means like above or more. So the type of lens that they use is what's known as a convex lens, or we know it as a converging lens. And so that's what this lens here is what's represented in purple, okay? So if someone, if their eyeball is too, I'll just write it in red here. If their eyeball is too short, where is the image formed? Is it in front or behind? Behind the retina. So the image is formed behind the retina. And so in order to correct this, we need to bring this image closer to get it to the back of the retina. And so the type of lens that they use is a convex because once it hits um, at this point, it, the angle of refraction, it starts to bend down, right? And so it converges at a shorter point compared to, to here, okay? So that's for someone that is um, farsighted. Um, I also have a presbyopia. So this is what's known as, um, it literally means like um, old, like old eyesight. So people that are, like a lot of people that are older, they need um, cheaters as they call them, they call them their cheaters, like whenever they like read a book or whatever at night. Or, you know, that's just an example. But um, for presbyopia, what happens is the muscles that bend the lens, so I'm gonna point that out um, on the eye model. I actually have, I have it on here. So, yeah, it's kind of hard. I'm gonna bring it closer to the camera. But this part right here, this is the ciliary muscle. So the ciliary muscle, it, there's these um, what's known as suspensory ligaments that'll attach to the lens. So in order for that lens to bend, right, in order for to Im increase that refraction that occurs, those ciliary muscles have to be um, working, right? But the strength of those muscles, they start, it's not as good as you get older, okay? So you, they, the lens doesn't bend as well, okay? So that's um, as far as uh, what presbyopia is. Okay, so the next one is nearsighted. So if someone is nearsighted, the term is myopic, and the type of lens that we use is a concave or what's known as a diverging lens. So if you look at the shape of the lens, it's a little bit smaller here, but if I was like to blow this up and to show you like what it looks like if you compare these two. So for the diverging lens, this one's not, I'll just use blue. So the diverging lens looks like this. Compared to the converging lens, it looks like this. So light is going to bend down, bend down, but then for the diverging lens, once it goes here, it goes out that way, out that way. Right, so in this particular case, the eyeball is gonna be too long. So if the eyeball is too long, the image is gonna be formed in front of the retina. Okay, so that's for um, corrective vision, the type of lenses that they use, um, and what's the scenario as to why some of these things happen and how we can go about um, fixing it. Okay, so I'm gonna go uh, back and we're going to identify uh, some of the 
um, other structures. So I'm going to come back to this side. Okay, so let's finish this small one and then we'll go back to the big one. Okay, so we've already identified here the iris, the pupil, and then this is the ciliary muscle which is here in the front. So I'm going to take this out. and center it. Okay, so it's centered here. And I've already pointed out this is the choroid. It gives the blood supply. So then these blood vessels that are coming up this way, these are what's known as the ciliary arteries. So they're there on the front and the back. So um, there are particular names for them. It's really simple. So the ones that are short, they just call them short ciliary arteries. And the ones that are long, they call them long ciliary arteries. The ones that are in the front, these are what's known as the anterior ciliary arteries. Okay, so then the part that's here in blue, this is what's known as the vorticose vein. So it's helping to drain the deoxygenated blood. So one thing about this is that, remember the arteries are carrying oxygenated blood to the eye. It's giving it the eye its nutrients that it needs. And then the veins are getting the, um, it's blood that has um, more carbon dioxide than oxygen that we're draining that to get it back into the venous system. So what this eventually leads to is that it'll um, eventually get to the internal jugular vein, which is what we identified on the torso model. So you should remember that from the flow of uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, so that's uh, some of the external features. So I'm gonna take this off and then point out to you what I was discussing earlier. So I'll put this down. So you see these little ligaments here? That's what I was talking about early, number 24. So these are the suspensory ligaments. That's what's going to attach to the lens. And then um, this is um, part of the ciliary muscle. You just call it, this is where the um, ciliary body would be. Okay, so we have that. And then the next thing I want to point out, so I've already showed you the lens here. And then here on the back side. Um, so there are two types of fluid that are within the eye. So you have aqueous humor and then vitreous humor. So aqueous humor is a more of a, it's more like a watery-like substance compared to the vitreous humor, which is more thicker. And so that's what, right, you should have been able to identify that during the, the eye dissection. Okay, so this is the um, vitreous humor. And then this is, this part here, this is the retina. So you have the retina, and then these are the retinal arteries, and then this part, kind of like a purplish, that's the retinal veins. And then um, this is the optic disc, so this is the blind spot of the eye. And then you have the macula lutea, which is this um, part where there's a high um, density of the cones here. So there's lots and lots of cones that are here. So the difference between rods and cones, we're gonna, I'm gonna point that out on the model, but cones are for like colored vision, and rods are for um, dark vision, like seeing like black and white, and it's also also for like peripheral vision, because there are more, there are a lot more rods than there are um, cones, but there is a bunch of the cones that are found at this particular region. So that's why they call this um, the macula lutea, lutea, and then the fovea centralis, because lutea it refers to like um, light. Okay, so fovea centralis once again, that's where there's a bunch of um, of the cones that are found there. Okay, so th that's it for um, this model. A couple other things I wanted to point out on this one. So what I like about this model is that you can see all three of those layers that I've been talking about just looking at it from the external. So you can see this part here, which is the retina, this is the choroid, the vorticose vein is there, and then you can see the sclera where the eye muscles are going to attach. You can also see the ciliary nerves there that are coming here to the front. Um, so if I take this off, yeah, it's pretty much the exact same as the other one. Uh, the only difference was, like what I was showing you on the board, this is where the um, ciliary uh, muscles are found that help to contract the lens. Okay, so that's gonna do it for the big eye model and then also the small eye model. So I'm going to leave these, I'm just going to leave the big one up there. And then 
Uh, one other thing I have drawn on the board. So the different compartments of the eye. So you have segments and then you also have chambers. So for the anterior segment is divided into the anterior and posterior chambers. So what separates these two is what's known as the, the iris. So that's the colored part of the eye. Compared to the anterior and the posterior segment, that's what's where the lens is found. So once you get, to, once you get behind the lens of the eye, that's where all of the, I'll actually write this. This is important. This is where the vitreous humor is found. What I was talking about early, earlier. And then uh, over here, within this particular region, you have the aqueous, so aqueous humor. Okay. So that's like the different regions, what type of fluid is found within each part, how they're divided. And so the next model we're going to is the micro, um, the micro anatomy. So I'm gonna come here up here to the front and show you some of the particular regions. So once again, this is the part, white part of the eye, it's the sclera, this is the choroid where you get the blood supply. And then this is where, um, this is where the retina is found. Okay, so um, with that being said, we'll kind of like start here at the bottom and kind of like work our way up. So this here, this is the uh, pigment secreting cells. So these particular cells, they're, they're right next to the rods and the cones. So that's what these are here. These are the rods and the cones. But what, the, uh, what these particular cells do, they secrete. What they secrete is what's known as um, a melanin. So they secrete melanin and then they also secrete um, vitamin A. So both of these things are essential in order for like for proper um, vision. So the function of like what melanin does, so melanin helps to absorb light. So if you think about, you know, if you're like, if it's during the summer, you, know, you don't wear, a, well, sometimes you, I guess you're like wearing like a black t-shirt. Right? What happens when you wear a black t-shirt, like when it's real hot? You get real hot, right? Because all of, all of that light is being absorbed. Uh, from having the, the black t-shirt. And so um, the pigment melanin, right, that's what helps to um, absorb all of that light, right, because this is what we want. We want that to happen so that way we can activate all of these different um, photoreceptors. Okay, so that leads me to my next point, to so the rods and the cones. I already said rods are for dark vision, cones are for um, light vision. So let's point them out. So these, are, so these are the rods right here, and then these are what's known as the cones. So there are particular regions of the, these um, photoreceptors. So this is the external segment, and then this is the internal segment. So here at the internal segment, you have all of these different, these are the mitochondria. Right? What is the mitochondria? It's the what? Powerhouse. Yeah, everyone knows that. Yeah, power, the powerhouse of the cell. And all of these particular lines here, these are all just, it's basically, they're just kind of like, if you look at this, it kind of looks like stacks of pennies but um, it's all just, it's like a folded cell membrane, like a phospholipid bilayer um, here within, within the rods and then within the cones. So I'm gonna discuss like why this is significant, um, but let's still go over some of the other things. So this is the nucleus, um, and then and this is where they're gonna synapse here with the next particular um, type of cells. So these are, they call these are the synaptic bulbs. Okay, so um, one other thing, just to like, to make sure that you can distinguish between the two, because if you kind of like just glaze over, they kind of look um, similar. But if you look at the rods, they're more slender compared to the cones, they're shorter and then they're shaped more like a cone. So that's like to distinguish between the two. Okay, so then working our way up. So let me tell you like, once again, what we need to get to. So we need to get to this particular part. So these are the um, ganglion cells where all of these axons are going to converge. Once they start to converge, this is the part where the optic nerve comes out. Okay, and then it follows along that pathway that's there on the board. And so um, in order, so if you think about the pathway of light, so light travels in, it strikes the back of the retina, and then it travels in this direction going this way. So it goes back this way, and then it activates these particular receptors, which will then um, submit the signal. So let's look at some of the other types of um, photoreceptors or, or different um, components. 
So these here, these are the bipolar cells right here. So you can see uh, both of them, the different projections coming off. So bipolar cells, and then um, these ones that are here that are closer toward the rods and the cones, these are the horizontal cells. And then the ones that are up here, let me take this sticker off. This is what's known as the amacrine cell. Okay, so we activate these different rods and cones and then the signal gets back, sent back this way and it goes to the optic nerve. But what happens here within the rods and the cones? So let's talk about that. So what I have drawn on the board, this is what represents, so this is a rod and this is a cone. So um, let's say that you know, you're, in your, you're in your bedroom, right? you just wake up, and then you then turn on the light. So whenever you're in dark light, the rods are what's going to be um, responsible for the vision. But once you turn the light on, you're going to activate the cones. So how is it that we uh, shut off the rods and turn on the cones? So that's what I'm going to talk about here. We're going to go over what's known as the um, phototransduction. So there's a signaling cascade in order for this process to happen. And so what it ultimately leads to, so what the end of the story is that hyperpolarization of the cell occurs. So when hyperpolarization occurs of the cell, is then action potential going to happen? No, right? Depolarization is to initiate an action potential. So we have to shut these off. Well, how, how do we go about um, shutting the rods off? So once again, we look here at the rods, the stacked membranes. So that's what these are here. That's what I have drawn here. And then these little purple dots that I have shown, that's what is representing this. So this here is the phospholipid bilayer. And then this is this little protein that's embedded within there. So this protein that's embedded, it's known as opsin. So opsin and what's known as 11 cis retinal, they form the complex which is known as rhodopsin. Okay. So whenever light strikes this particular molecule here, 11 cis retinal, so this is not an organic chemistry class. Okay, so like we don't need to know like the specifics, um, but based off of this structure, what you look at it, so this is a, we have this part which is the cis bond, and then the trans bond is what's over here. So in order, once light strikes strikes this uh, particular complex, it changes the conformation of this 11 cis retinal. So it'll change the conformation into 11 trans retinal and activates what's known as our secondary messenger system. Um, and so um, this is an important concept because once we get to like the hormones, um, even that's the next semester, but even when we start talking more about some of the other special senses, the second they're regulated by the secondary messenger system. So what's included in the secondary messenger system, we're not going to go over like, like some, it's called, um, the G protein is known as transducin, but once this happens, the 11, when it turns to 11 uh, trans retinal, that's what activates uh, the G protein and activates what's known as phosphodiesterase. So this is an enzyme. And what this enzyme does is it converts what's known as cyclic GMP into um, five prime GMP. It's just basically just changing uh, similar to how you're going from cis to trans. Um, cyclic means that it's a ring, but if it's not cyclic, it just means that it opens up the ring. So once that ring is open, what the result is, this um, secondary messenger will then, um, a lot of times what they do is they will like bind to the channel. So it'll bind to the sodium channel. And if, if we're preventing a positive thing from coming into the cell, what is the result? It becomes more negative, right? So that's what leads to hyperpolarization. So this is the process that's going to turn off the rods. Okay, uh, one other thing, so the visual pathway, um, what I have drawn here, so this is like a cross section of the brain and the different um, anatomy, so this is the optic nerve, the optic chiasma, this is the optic tract, this is the thalamus, which is where the lateral geniculate nucleus is, and then the occipital lobe is found here for vision. So this is just the pathway that it takes. These are the different um, axons or the different neurons have to be activated in order for this process to um, happen. So this nerve, right, once again, that's a cranial nerve, the optic nerve. So this is just the pathway that it takes in order to, for us to interpret the image um, that we see. Okay, 
Are there any questions? No? OK, that's going to do it for this lecture.